Hi, YSI. Hey, welcome Let's back to the Hello. Lighthouse. For the final time, we're going to greet you from the Lighthouse. Wow, this has been 10 amazing days. We are I completely it's blown away. Over. It's not over incredible. yet, though. <laughs> well, we're really glad as you're watching the live stream. Welcome. You are also more than welcome to join us inside the Lighthouse directly by joining the Zoom call. Actually, Martin Guzman and Rob are right there with us. So don't forget about that. But just to, let's take a quick moment to come all together and just take stock about these amazing 10 days of YSI Planner we've had together. For that, but for us to kick it off and for us to sort of look at all that, let's just recap that we've had an amazing days in the questions fair. Thomas, what happened there? Well, we are going to know very soon because now we're going to have the closing keynote with Martin Guzman and Rob Johnson. And then after that, we're going to have a closing ceremony. And the highlight of that is, of course, going to be the revelation of what is currently the most, the most popular questions, the top 100 questions of the questions graph. And to top that off, if that's not exciting enough, the questions are going to be in, wrapped to us by Nathan Oglesby, who you maybe know already because he's the guy who made the main theme and the small introduction videos to every time we entered the constellations. And I'm definitely looking forward to that. So stay around to the closing ceremony after the first keynote. Yeah, just remember, this is Last all keynote. for us. It's all for us together to celebrate what we've achieved, to come together for one final time in the Lighthouse as a community. And to kick us off, it's my distinct honor to now introduce our keynote speaker. He is an internationally recognized expert on debt, restructuring, and sovereign bankruptcies. He's an associate research scholar at Columbia University. He's an associate professor at the University of Buenos Aires. He received his PhD at Brown University. He's an amazing human being and an incredible friend. Please allow me to welcome to the stage, the current economic minister of Argentina, Martin Guzman. And as well, I would like to welcome to the stage, thank you, Rob, the president of INET, Rob Johnson. Let me just say that Martin will speak for 15 minutes. And Rob will follow right directly for a quick discussion of uh, the talk that Martin is giving. And then we'll engage in a quick Q&A. And before we go into the closing ceremony, we'll hear some parting thoughts and well wishes from Martin and Rob before we head over. So Martin's talk is entitled IMF Programs for Stabilization, Lessons from the Past, Experience and the Way Forward. So with that, it's my great pleasure. Martin, take it away. Thank you very much, Jay and, and everyone for joining today. I see uh, a number of uh, familiar faces, uh, friends, and it's a great pleasure to be here at the plenary closing session of YSI, uh, and especially to share it with Rob Johnson, president of INET. Uh, Rob uh, has played a very important, a great leadership role uh, for the YSI community. Uh, for many of us who were uh, forming ourselves as professionals, I had the privilege to share uh, time with Rob and learn from him. And when I came to uh, when I took office and I started to serve as Minister of Economy, uh, addressing real problems that uh, would affect uh, the lives of millions of people, uh, uh, Rob's leadership transcended. And he was also very helpful uh, in processes that were critical, in particular in Argentina's debt restructuring process that we just went through. So uh, it was uh, absolutely rewarding to see that uh, Rob's leadership uh, at the young scholars level then transcended to more practical Maria. issues. So he is serving to, to us as a leader in a wider role. So thank you for that, Rob. And um, as you know, I, I'm gonna, I'll, I've been part of the YSI community, I've been part of the INET community for years. I may be the first member of the community who starts serving as Minister of Economy of a Sovereign Nation. Um, and what I'm going to speak about today is something that has been uh, one of the uh, topics of uh, study and research uh, over the last decade for me, and now I'm dealing with this uh, in a prat practical uh, a manner, which is uh, the resolution of macroeconomic crisis, uh, the role that the IMF has historically played, and the role that we expect the, the IMF to play in the near future. Uh, Argentina uh, will serve as an illustration of the uh, themes I will raise today, 
uh, precisely because Argentina recently had a program with IMF and standby agreement that was signed in 2018. And now uh, we are negotiating a new program that replace, replaces that one that, that was not a successful program for restore macro stability. So let me, let me uh, first uh, frame the kind of problems or, or the kind of economic and macroeconomic problems uh, we are uh, referring to today. Uh, the, the object of the discussion is uh, the kind of macroeconomic crisis uh, that affects uh, emerging economies in which uh, the uh, foreign currency debt becomes unsustainable, in which uh, eco the economy starts to contract, uh, in which there is a loss of confidence, uh, there is a fall in economic activity, uh, increases in unemployment, increases in poverty, and that require uh, to change the direction of policies, to change uh, a, a, the, the economic programs in general, in order to reverse to revert dynamics that uh, are destabilizing both at the economic and the social level. Uh, we've seen many of these episodes. We've seen uh, about 170 uh, sovereign debt restructurings uh, in context of a economic and social distress over the last four decades. Uh, in many of them, uh, the IMF has played a role. And in some of them, uh, the IMF has played a more extensive role uh, through a, an IMF program agreed with uh, the governments and, and the IMF. Um, there are two types of programs that uh, the IMF uh, has. One is called the, the standby and the other is called the extended fund facility. The standby programs are based on the idea that uh, the troubles that an economy is going through have to do with uh, transitory problems of confidence uh, transitory problems of liquidity. Uh, so they are, are um, built on the basis of assumption that there are no structural problems that need to be addressed. Um, the extended fund facility programs on the other side uh, are based on the premise that the economies have structural problems and that need reforms in order to uh, restore or resolve a balance of payment problems. So the first uh, issue we need to discuss is the problem with this distinction between uh, a crisis being just a confidence crisis or a crisis uh, reflecting fundamental problems in the economy. Usually uh, a confidence crisis, a liquidity crisis, uh, or I would say not just usually, but virtually always has to do with fundamental problems in the economy, or at least with the perception that something is fundamentally wrong with the economic model of the, of the country in a situation of distress. We could think about uh, why uh, creditors or investors will have no confidence and there will be no liquidity in an economy if everyone believed that there are no fundamental problems in the economy. That's uh, counterintuitive. Uh, any time in which there is a liquidity problem, that's a reflection that uh, there are perceptions of some sort of unsustainability in the underlying economic structure. And the distinction of uh, problems being just confidence problems versus problems being more structural uh, usually has led to uh, uh, flow uh, understanding or misunderstandings of what actually is happening in the economies in distress. So over the uh, last few decades, what we've seen is uh, troubles when it comes to uh, resolving macroeconomic crisis through uh, IMF programs. Uh, what's been very common over the last few decades is that these programs come when it's just an SBA and standby agreement based on the idea that there is a confidence shock. These problems uh, are based on the idea that uh, contraction in fiscal policy uh, will be effective to create a positive confidence shock that will decrease the cost of credit and therefore will be effective for restoring uh, economic stability and economic growth. And that contraction in monetary policy uh, in inflationary environments may be effective to, to reduce inflation levels. Uh, what usually happens is the opposite. Contraction in a contractionary fiscal policy in the context of an economic contraction is usually contractionary and uh, it leads to uh, deeper problems. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a, the extended fund facility programs in the past 
based on the idea that the countries need structural reforms, were not a programs oriented uh, to achieve uh, development goals. Uh, they were uh, programs uh, that were mostly based on the idea that what was needed was the kind of standard labor reforms and pension reforms that we've seen over the, over the last few decades. And in the context of a recession, those kind of reforms were generally uh, generated were deeper problems in the economy. They decrease the aggregate demand. And in the context of a recession, a lower aggregate demand leads to a deeper recession, more unemployment, more poverty. So the record in the past is not good, but uh, there is certainly uh, the possibility of changing the course of history uh, looking forward. And I'm gonna refer specifically to that because we've been having a very constructive engagement uh, with the IMF authorities. Uh, I will describe uh, where Argentina stands today. So very briefly, uh, in what happened over the last few years in Argentina when it came to the relationship with the IMF. Uh, first, in 2016, the Argentina, after recovering access to international credit markets, uh, started to borrow again. But in 2018, uh, there was a massive change in expectations, a massive negative shock. Uh, that led to a big currency crisis that became unsustainable and uh, the uh, government signed a, a standby agreement with the IMF precisely based on the idea that contractionary monetary policy and contractionary fiscal policy would be effective for restoring confidence, for uh, stabilizing prices and returning Argentina to a path of stability. It did not work. Over the last two years, and this was even before COVID-19, in 2018 and 2019, all economic and social indicators deteriorated. There were two consecutive years of recession. Now in the context of COVID-19, we have the third consecutive year of recession. Uh, inflation uh, increased rather than uh, decreased. Uh, economic activity, not only economic activity decreased, but unemployment reached two digits. Uh, and as I said, all social and economic indicators deteriorated. Now, uh, what we've been doing is to uh, negotiate a new program. We are right in the middle of that. There is an, an IMF mission in Argentina these days. And uh, the goal is to do something which is absolutely different than what has been done uh, in the past as the norm and what has been, what was done in Argentina in 2018. We want a program that is aligned with the sustainable development goals. We want a program that is based on different premises than the standard ones. Uh, understanding that uh, part of what needs to be done is to put the numbers in order. So there has to be a path that guarantees fiscal sustainability, which has been historically a problem in Argentina, but the combination of fiscal and monetary policies has to respect the principle that there is no restoration of economic stability without uh, uh, restoration of economic growth. So what we need is a plan for restoring economic growth that is not based on the standard tenets of fiscal austerity. Uh, it will be of the essence that the path towards fiscal equilibrium respects the uh, idea that uh, real sp spending does not fall, or public spending in real terms does not fall. How we're gonna get to, to that point? Uh, well, uh, we are uh, laying out a path in which Argentina will go from the difficult position in, it, in, it, in which it is today in the context of COVID-19 towards fiscal equilibrium at a velocity, at a speed that is consistent with economic growth, uh, redefining how we spend. Uh, we are spending more on uh, what has a bigger effect on uh, economic recovery in the near term and on increasing productivity on a medium term basis, like uh, public infrastructure, education, public health, uh, research and development, science, all aspects that are uh, what countries that aspire to higher levels of economic development need to do. When it comes to the uh, so-called structural reforms, we are also being innovative and creative. We're not doing the, the standard uh, uh, structural reforms of all uh, extended fund facility programs like the labor market reform or the pension reform 
On the contrary, uh, uh, with the, the uh, population, the pensioners uh, are being protected. And uh, part of what happened over the last few years is that they experienced a decrease in their incomes in real wages. And we are restoring uh, the uh, incomes of pensioners in, in real terms. So the, the kind of structural reforms or growth enhancing reforms that uh, the next program will uh, have or that we intend the program to have uh, are uh, those as uh, the development of the domestic capital markets, uh, pushing competition policy to have a more competitive environment, uh, policies that uh, make the workings of the energy sector more efficient and vibrant, uh, policies, policies that push the development of the knowledge sector, as everywhere in the world, there is big potential in the in services based in that are intensive in knowledge. So that's what we've been doing uh, in a context in which we are trying to resolve a deep problem, a deep crisis in which all sides have responsibility. Uh, we just went through a debt restructuring with private creators. Uh, in which uh, we managed to get an acceptance rate of 99% and obtain substantial relief. The IMF played a positive role uh, in assessing the debt sustainability constraints in a serious way. So now we want to have an IMF program that does not look at the ones from the past. And it's more modern, more creative with a sense of responsibility and We've, as I said, we've been working constructively with, with under the with, with Kristalina Georgieva, with the managing director, and we will continue working with the G7 countries towards that goal. Uh, it is a critical time for, for my country, uh, a very important one. We face a historic opportunity here to stabilize the economy and returning to economic growth. And um, we are doing uh, step by step uh, what we think it needs to be done in order to get there. So. Uh, I look forward to Rob's comments and to your comments and questions. And thank you very much again for the invitation to be part of this closing session. Very nice. And uh, I must say, uh, I take a great deal of pleasure in being able to be alongside Martin Guzman today in front of the YSI. In part, you are looking at constellations, Orion and Taurus and all these things in the sky. But one of the beacons that you can rely upon for your future is the career of Martin Guzman unfolding, which has what you might call all of the balance and all of the depth that one can achieve through working with people like Joseph Stiglitz, Pope Francis and Scola Sacrarentis and the, uh, and the young scholars that surround you. And the strength that he's shown in this very difficult time is important to not only Argentina, but to the entire world. With the pandemic crisis, we reached into a very, very different space. There is a rather uh, false consciousness of that debtor-credit relationships are all about the recklessness or responsibility of a debtor. Uh, I think that's a false consciousness under any circumstance. And one can look at the LDC debt crisis of the 1970s, uh, following the uh, increase in the uh, interest rates in the United States to stomp out our inflation. There are all kinds of risks over which the emerging economies have never had control, but can affect their future and their capacity to service the debt. But secondly, uh, the pandemic is obviously not something that emanated from Argentina. It's something where, which we can't say it's hard to pin the responsibility any particular place or region, but is a global phenomenon onto which they were all, all emerging and underdeveloped countries have been subjected as well as everyone else. So when it came to restructuring this debt, Martin, who had done very, very good work on the question of sovereign debt restructuring in his work as a postdoctoral fellow that I had supported at Columbia University with Joseph Stiglitz, his work with the United Nations, he was very well prepared for it, the position as Minister of the Economy in this crisis. 
But what you underscored as I watched and as I discussed with you was that it is very difficult now to make a precedent of protecting the creditors and putting society, in this case Argentina, through the ringer as though they had done something wrong. And everybody understood that. And this happened in the context following the great financial crisis, where as your mentor, Joe Stiglitz often said, the polluters got paid and everybody else suffered. And the restoration of faith and trust in governance, particularly financial governance, the faith and trust in the future of multilateral financial institutions like the IMF, all were hanging in the balance and they depended upon you and the people you work with to have a strong spine and a clear vision of where the fulcrum of fairness stood in this unprecedented circumstance. And what you did, and why I say it's more important than just Argentina, is that you were the first up in the baseball metaphor, first to bat. But the, the precedent that was set by the struggle that you engaged in with the creditors and how the IMF was engaged is a bellwether for what others can expect to see as the crisis continues and deepens. And to come up with a more balanced and humane, uh, how do you say, restructuring and outcome was not only beneficial, the strength of your spine and the quality of your mind contribute to the well-being of people throughout the entire emerging world. And I know people at UNCTAD and others, Ursula Costantini used to be with us and now works with Richard Colza right there. And, uh, I've talked with her at some length. I've talked with Stephanie Blanken, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, I think that Argentina stood up for a new balance of right and wrong in a way that will have, we're down to the benefit of humankind in the years to come. So thank you, Martin, for what you're doing and for the example that you set. Thank you, Martin, and thank you, Rob. We're so happy to have both of you here on this call with us today as the last keynote session, especially because I think as, as Rob's closing words just emphasized, I think you serve as an example to many of us as young scholars, as someone who really knows YSI, who's been a longtime friend of YSI, and uh, who we're now really rooting for more than ever. So thank you so much for being here. To those of you who are, who are watching, um, please type any questions that you might have for Martin Guzman and or Rob in the comments and I might be able to call on you to ask your question directly if you're able to turn your camera on and unmute yourself when I call on you. We already have one queued up, um, which is a question for Martin Guzman from Noe Martinez. Noe, would you like to go ahead and unmute yourself? Yes, thank you. Uh, hi everyone, Martin. Uh, thanks for your 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 conference, your speak. Uh, and my question is: What do you consider the most innovative action to combat the cause and effects of financial crisis in Latin America? Thank you, Nan, for a question. Thank you very much, Ro, for for your words. Um, so when, no, when it comes to Latin America, uh, while we do see um, different realities in different countries, uh, there are some common structural problems that the region has faced, has been facing for years. Uh, during the times of the uh, commodity, the super commodity boom, as it's been called, the, the previous decade, um, there was a large decrease in inequality levels in the region um, with large decrease in inequality levels in most of the countries in Latin America. That was certainly the case of Argentina. Uh, but what did not happen uh, during that decade was uh, a significant change in the levels of uh, diversification of the structure of production. Um, we did not see uh, a solid resolution 
to the structural problems of uh, labor informality, social inclusion, or poverty. Uh, the uh, most Latin American economies are still dependent on a, a quite reduced uh, basket of commodities. And when we see changes in the terms of trade, what we see uh, is suffering. When we see a decrease in terms of trade, uh, a, we see suffering in, in several of the Latin American economies. Of course, every reality is different, but uh, if we look across countries, we do see that there are problems of poverty, inequality, labor inclusion in formal labor markets that are prevalent in many of these economies. So I would say that the region as a whole, what it needs is to transit from what it is today to uh, an integrated uh, continent with structures of production that are effective at first uh, delivering job creation for the different segments of the demo demographic structure. Uh, and that means that there will be also a need for job creation that of the kind of less skill uh, uh, jobs. Uh, second, um, Productivity, there, are, there needs to be policies that are oriented towards increasing the levels of productivity because uh, the size of the pie is not large enough in order for uh, a being possible just through redistribution to resolve the problems that the region faces. And productivity uh, growth has been a problem in most of the Latin American economies. We, we've seen stagnant productivity in the region for quite a while. And, and third, uh, a stability that requires that uh, the production of tradable goods uh, grows at a pace that is consistent with economic growth that the countries need in order to resolve the problems of employment and poverty uh, when in our region when countries grow they demand more imports elasticity of imports to economic growth is not low so uh, in order for growth to be sustained exports have to grow and this requires uh, a, a more diversified structure of production not dependent only on on, on just a few number of commodities. So that's when it comes to the practical level. Then uh, you, you ask about financial crisis. Every country is different. Uh, clearly, financial crises have to be resolved. When there are debt crises, the kind of financial crisis that is a debt crisis, debts need to be restructured. It, it is not okay to put more suffering on societies that are suffering to meet debt payments that cannot be sustained. Uh, well, that's actually what we did. Uh, in this case, Argentina's case was a, a quite a special one because it was the first case in which the um, modern collective action clauses for sovereign debt restructuring were tested. Uh, we will have a long discussion about how the system is working, which is not of the topic for today, but happy to respond if the questions come that way. Uh, but again, every financial situation is different. What is uh, certain for all Latin American economies is that it is very important to develop capital markets and develop uh, a debt, public debt markets in domestic currency for Latin American economies to be less dependent on financing in foreign currency. Because that kind of currency mismatch is what contributes to financial and macroeconomic instability that has consequences uh, that are real, consequences for the real economy. Thank you, Martin. I've got the next question already queued up for you. Amariles Abreu is here to ask it. Amariles, are you with us? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Um, so first of all, um, hello to all good friends that I see online today. Hello, Rob, and actually, hola, Martin. Um, I just have two questions. Thank you very much for your um, summary in terms of what is planned to happen there next with the IMF. I was just um, wondering on two points. I was wondering first on um, which um, specific um, critical sustainable development goals um, will be the target of the pursue arrangement, if you can say something on that regard. And I was also wondering um, if any, what will be the standing of the pursue arrangement on human rights? Thank you, Marilis. Uh, it's very good to see you. Um, thank you for the questions. So uh, with respect to the development goals, uh, let, let me be more, more comprehensive here. We basically, uh, uh, our macro strategy and, and policy strategy in general 
pursues uh, five development goals. Uh, the first is uh, social inclusion that requires a, a cre jobs creation. The second is uh, productivity growth, uh, precisely because dynamism is a necessary condition for sustained economic growth and to provide an environment of safety to, to the people in the country. The third is uh, macroeconomic stability, and that requires to resolve one fundamental problem in Argentina's economy, which is a problem of stagnant exports. Uh, when we look at the exports trend, we see an, an stagnant trend over the, over the last uh, seven years approximately. And, and that has been, that's been a balance of payment constraint for economic growth. It actually affected the possibilities of economic growth of Argentina. And at the same time, as part of this third goal of, of economic stability, we need to uh, uh, put the fiscal accounts in order, which in the context of COVID-19, of course, uh, they, we had to increase the fiscal deficit uh, in a sizable way uh, because we had to spend more uh, and also the economic contraction led to a decrease in, in fiscal revenues. The fourth development goal uh, is to have equitable development at the federal, at the regional level for the different regions of the country. Argentina is a federal nation, a federal republic, different realities in different provinces of the country. So equity across regions it's a very important development goal for us. And the fifth one is sovereignty. Whatever we do, it's us who do it. This was also a very important principle in the sovereign debt restructuring that we had with uh, our private creditors. And it's also a very important principle when it comes to negotiating a program with the IMF. It is going to be our program and it's not going to be just a program decided by the government of Argentina. The government of Argentina will negotiate the program with the IMF, but we will submit it to National Congress for its approval to make uh, uh, out of this stabilization program, not just a government policy, but a state policy. And the second part of the question had to do with human rights. Uh, again, this was, uh, a, a, was at the center of the negotiations with our private creditors where, when we started the negotiations uh, in March and they, they, they went until, until August. Uh, it, we had to, this is a principle that has to be respected, respect for human rights. Uh, in, we consider that the set of creditors was not just the formal creditors, but also the informal ones who are the people to which the sovereign has obligations, the workers, the pensioners. So, and this will be also a central premise in what is coming next. Thank you, Martin. I think we have time for two more questions, but I'd, I'd like to take the opportunity to ask one myself, actually to, to both you and Rob, um, also because this is the last session we have and we are looking toward what's next. My question for you both is, uh, what do you hope YSI will work toward starting tomorrow, our first day after the YSI plenary? Rob, perhaps I can turn the floor to you first and then go back to Martin. Well, what I always hope that YSI works for is giving all of you the reinforcement to have, how do you say, the courage of your convictions that you feel, as I know you all do, a dedication to knowledge a dedication to one another, but a, uh, what you might call a, a pressure to define what is good and what is purposeful. And I think it's a very, very treacherous domain because some people are pleasers and they lose their compass. And other people, how do I say, are just irritable and never really make a difference. But I think with a constructive community, which you've defined under the leadership of Jay, Heska and Thomas, you have a chance to strengthen each other, to learn together. And you're not children any longer. You are on the on-ramp to becoming the leaders and the people who carry the responsibility for the kind of future that my young children 
will experience. So I wish you the best of luck. And uh, I, uh, I'm very, very uh, inspired by the path that you're on. Thank you, Rob. It's very encouraging to hear you always. Martin. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Hesk. Hesk. Um, so um, first, I couldn't agree more with uh, what Rob says, uh, and it's, uh, uh, it's a very encouraging words. Uh, from my experience uh, with YSI, I would define YSI as an environment that is conducive to learning. Uh, we need to uh, create societies that learn, that are tolerant, in we, learning requires that we all listen to each other, that we reflect from what we listen, uh, that um, we act with responsibility, that act uh, in, a, in a bold and decisive way when it's needed, but that whenever we get to have power, we use the power with responsibility. So that's why using the power of responsibility requires that we learn to use that kind of responsibility. And that's the kind of environment that I've seen in YSI uh, and the kind of environment that we need to continue pushing for. It's a very good one that creates networks that connect people uh, from all over the world. Uh, and these are the kind of collection, connections that help us build a understanding of different realities, of different mindsets, uh, different frameworks for, for uh, thinking about life in general. Uh, and I very much hope to see more of the same. Thank you so much. I think we are headed to our last question from, from our audience, from the community, and with us here to ask it, and I hope you'll be able to turn on your camera, is Sergio Paez. Hi. Hola, Martí. Hi, Rob. Thank you, Eske. Hi to everyone here. Well, I'm a member of uh, States and Markets Working Group. So our questions are related with power and institution and this relationship with economics. So my question is also related with, with that issue and the EMF negotiation. Well, as, uh, maybe as you know, it's not only a discussion about economical or technical issues with the EMF. It's, they are also implying some discussion about their relationship with the United States, mainly, no? That, because it's the main voter. So how do you think that the scenario has changed since the Biden election? That's one. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. So that's a question for me, but it could also be a question for Rob. I, I will just make a, give a very short answer. And uh, if Rob wants to comment on how you, Rob, see uh, the, the geopolitics after the, the U.S. elections, we would like to uh, hear your views as well. So uh, certainly, uh, Sergio, uh, any uh, IMF program uh, is involves the geopolitical dimension, absolutely, and that's how negotiations occur. Uh, there is dialogue with the G7, the G20, uh, and um, what we need is to, or, or what this process requires to align all wheels on a point uh, that is a good one. And a point in this case that is positive when it comes to Argentina, positive for the development prospects of Argentina. And that's what we're doing. Uh, we've been working with the uh, uh, tr Trump's administration until, well, we continue working until January 20, and then we will naturally uh, continue working with a new administration after, after January 20. Uh, uh, we don't see, I mean, it's a transition that is uh, a go will be as any, any normal transition. Uh, Rob, if you want to comment something about the, the geopolitics and the U.S. election. Rob, you're on mute. Well, yeah, I think uh, there are a handful of things, briefly. Uh, I remember giving a speech in Mexico just after Donald Trump was elected, and the people in the audience were quite appalled that they were to blame for the problems in the United States. I flew from Mexico after this meeting to China and I met with one of the leaders there. And he said to me, China is a large country. We started with 1 40th of the per capita income of the United States. 
and there were bound to be adjustment difficulties. But to blame China over something we had no power, which is the absence of trade adjustment assistance and transformation and retraining and taking care of the American people so that everyone is better off and no one is worse off, as the mantra of free trade often puts it, was the failing of the American elite to have a broad-based democracy. Now, as Biden's administration comes in, I think in relation to Donald Trump, who resorted to the demonization of others in a kind of infantile nationalism, will be an improvement. The possibility for multilateral collaboration on climate, on debt restructuring, on the use of multilateral institutions like the World Bank, IMF, OECD, and others, United Nations, will be in a better place. But make no mistake, the United States, with its system of money politics, is very broken. It's not a good team and a bad team. Good and bad people exist in both parties, and they are under the pressure of what I call the commodification of social design, implementation, and enforcement. Needing money to, to survive as an elected official means you can't do what you might call the best vision of your heart. And America needs a lot of repair, even with a better alternative in the Biden administration, both domestically and internationally, or we will see the next Donald Trump and he will come in a different disguise, but his authoritarian, um, how would I say, disregard for democratic process and other members of humankind might be even more fierce than the president we see today. The president elect that we see today, excuse me. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Martin. I think with that uh, forward-looking notion, right, nonetheless challenging, but towards, towards the future that we are all working toward, we will soon hear your, your clothing, closing remarks, both of you, but first we'll swing it back to Jay Parklington over in the lighthouse, over in the studio. So let's go back Yay. to Jay. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Rob. I think we've chosen this theme of night sky to put stars up into the galaxies to help illuminate our path. But I can safely say that your words are shining so bright that we, we will also feel the guidance with your energy, your spirit, and the light you Thank propel. You. And I think with that, I'm really looking forward to your final remarks for us as we wrap up the YSI plenary. What are your final thoughts, your final words of encouragement for this, this Young Scholars community. We'll start with Rob, sorry, we'll start with Martin and then hand it over to Rob for some final remarks before we uh, head over to the closing ceremony. Martin, please. Thank you, Jay. Uh, so we, uh, we, the humanity, have enormous challenges ahead. We've always had. Uh, we face a big responsibility and we have uh, what it takes, we have the we have instruments. We have ourselves uh, 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 to to do what uh, to do many things. We can do many things to to change the reality of of millions and millions and millions of people all over the world. Over the last four decades or more, uh, we've seen, uh, as Piketty has documented, uh, increases a large increases in inequality within countries in the, especially in the Western Hemisphere that have contributed to more inequality of power as well, more, and that uh, reinforces the inequality of opportunities. Uh, we have a number of deficiencies in the international global financial architecture uh, that do not allow societies to perform in the way they could. Uh, in the, the INET Commission uh, uh, that uh, Joe Stiglitz, Stiglitz, Mike Spencer, and Rob have been a leading, uh, has been doing uh, great work on that dimension. I think it has inspired many of us who've been working in the young scholars community. Uh, and I think we just need to continue doing our best to, to move frontiers and uh, in the spirit that we uh, defined earlier, in this spirit in which 
we try to learn from each other, to listen from each other, to understand the realities that different societies, different people face, understanding different mindsets and doing this in always in a respectful way, uh, in a constructive way. It, that's the kind of communication and months of work that will help us. And, and I see a very bright future in this community that has grown, grown so much. Uh, it has been achieving remarkable things and uh, we should continue working together to, to deepen these achievements in what is coming. And over to you, Rob. Well, I'm tempted to uh, quote my mother being Scottish, uh, a band which perhaps has a sense of humor, but has the unfortunate name of the average white band. And it's time to pick up the pieces and we've got work to do are two of their most famous songs. As I look at the example of Martin, the example, first of all, of uh, Jay, Heska, Thomas, and the team, and the production staff, Nathan, and all the energy that you put in, I find myself encouraged. The word courage, as I spoke one other time in this conference, in its roots comes from the notion of heart and core age to tell the story of your time with your whole heart. To encourage is to wish that others would do so. I've enjoyed these conversations and I've greatly enjoyed the vitality that Nathan has brought to bear. And so I thought I would conclude with a little touch of poetry that's based on the question at the outset when I was talking with Martin's mentor, Joe Stiglitz, and they asked me what question would I, would I kick off the conference with? And it was how you were going to define your own purpose. So I wrote a little poem, the title of which is The North Star of Purpose. Community, not conformity, meets the challenges of normity. Your teammates help you sort and arrogance deport. Alone together we do strive to keep our world now quite alive. Stand up and ride the waves, I say, for purpose, not for raves today. Sometimes it's hard to see where to go when uncertainty means we just can't know. Sail together to unmask the true with help from your fellow crew. Be a porpoise in the storm when out at sea with your purpose to find inside the space called me. Conformity is not purpose, it's poison potion. It's false, falsely soothing lotion that will kill your forward motion. A vanity insanity that plays on your emotion. It hurts to not know, but you can't, cannot fake your way. Succumbing to your fear never makes things clear. False knowledge like a rock sinks and makes you a laughing stock. Pretense of knowledge, is that what is now college? What to do instead? To calm your painful head. Use laughter and gratitude before longitude and latitude. Conviction and compassion are action plans. Don't ration. We need both mind and heart when things appear to fall apart. Go inward from the start. Draw upon your inner art. It is the strength within that guides away from sin. And never stray too far. It's your heart that's your North Star. Thank you all for a wonderful conference.